from the 9-11 Omission Report by Jonathan Barlogi. COG War Games The first and most important point is continuity of government. This is the shadow government people talk about, the black ops spies and the black budget engineers of Area 51. In the same way as there is secession of powers in our democratic republic, such that the vice pres becomes the pres pro temp if the pres dies in office, and such that it goes all the way down the line to appointing the Senate whip majority leader as a commander-in-chief of the armed forces in a time of crisis. That's why COG was established, and that's essentially how it works. While secession of power works down the levels of a hierarchy, COG ensures redundancy of office at each of those levels. COG provides backups for all the necessary operating systems of the government. It provides alternative installations for the command functionality of the military in full, at least. There's no secret underground military installation since 1992 that offers redundancy of office to the Congress of elected officials. Now some of you may remember that I've talked about COG before. Well, it's time for an update. On 9-11-2001, the COG network of bases were on full alert, but not because of the hijacked planes. They were running national security training exercises on a massive scale. As part of Operation Global Guardian, described only as an annual exercise in the official literature, Vigilant Guardian was the drill of the day and involved running tests on NORAD and FAA security integrations systems. The test involved seeing what would happen if they shut the systems off. Until 10.39 a.m., Rumsfeld at Pentagon. On the day of 9-11, the Pentagon was running war games exercises across the country. In Operation Northern Vigilance, we are told, most of the Air Force was on deployment in Alaska and Canada. However, even according to Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld's testimony before the Congressional Committee appointed to investigate 9-11, some fighter jets were scrambled on 9-11. This is actually not what is reported in the final 9-11 Investigation Committee's report. In the 9-11 Commission report, it was stated that there were no fighter jets scrambled on 9-11 until after the Pentagon was hit. The reason given by neocon apologists for this discrepancy, it takes 12 minutes to get fighters airborne. No go code to scramble was issued until the aircraft was less than seven miles out from its target, the Pentagon. Here is a portion of Rumsfeld's testimony before the 9-11 committee. Quote, Gorlick. May I ask one more question, Mr. Chairman? We can't go into the content of the PDDs and the SEIBs here, and I can't even characterize them in order to ask you the next question that I would ask. So let me ask you this. Was it your understanding that the NORAD pilots who were circling over Washington, D.C. that morning had indeed received a shoot-down order? Rumsfeld When I arrived in the command center, one of the first things I heard, and I was with you, was that the order had been given and that the pilots, correction, not the pilots necessarily, but the command had been given the instructions that their pilots could, in fact, use their weapons to shoot down a commercial airliners filled with our people in the event that the aircraft appeared to be behaving in a threatening way and an unresponsive way. Source globalresearch.ca So, according to Rumsfeld, the order stood with the fighter jet pilots to shoot down the hostile aircraft. However, the order to scramble jets in the first place was not given until the aircraft was less than seven miles away. 
So, if U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld was left out of the loop of who was giving the orders, then who was it that delayed the order to scramble the jets in the first place? Assuming Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. military, President George W. Bush did, as he claims, give the command to shoot down hostile planes to his national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, in a phone conversation before entering Booker Elementary School, which, he should admit, was probably after the pet goat story and Andy Card's second warning, not before. And assuming that there even were jet fighters remaining at nearby Air Force bases, which is more than the official report itself will admit, assuming there were fighters that could have been scrambled on 9-11, and assuming that Bush gave the order to shoot in time, then we have to ask ourselves, Whose command or protocol was it that prevented any of the four hijacked planes on 9-11 having been shot down? First, let me deal with a myth or two. United 93 could have been shot down. This is true. It very well could have been. This would even explain why the jet fuel of the planes that felt the World Trade Center towers could burn at temperatures in excess of 3,000 degrees for 48 minutes, while there were no fires at all reported on the crash site of United 93. Perhaps a missile fired from a scrambled fighter jet exploded United 93 in the air, and this burned off all its jet fuel as well as obliterating it into dust. Possible. Unlikely but worth considering. So, if we assume that the series of events proceeded thus, 1. World Trade Center 1 and 2 are struck. 2. Bush orders shoot down. 3. Planes deployed and Pentagon struck. 4. United 93 strikes down. Then we can account for the event that planes were deployed too late to save World Trade Center 1 and 2 as merely the same government incompetence that dictated no jets could be scrambled to fire on the incoming aircraft until it was less than seven miles out from the Pentagon. But was it only government incompetence? Let's delve deeper. Until 10.39 a.m. Cheney at White House. According to Transportation Secretary Norman Minetta, questioned by Lee Hamilton, Vice Chairman of the 9-11 Commission, about the shoot-down stand-down order, or GO code, he was not at the Presidential Emergency Operating Center at the time when the order was given, via Condoleezza Rice, by the President to shoot down hostile aircraft. However, and this is according to his testimony, which can be viewed as video footage online on YouTube. Vice President Dick Cheney was notified of the approach of the aircraft when it was still 50 miles out from the Pentagon. The page who notified him even asked the Vice President, does the order still stand? Finally, at 10 miles out, the Vice President, quote, whipped his head around and said, Of course the order still stands. Have you heard anything to the contrary? End quote. In short, the shoot-down order given by Bush while at Booker to Condoleezza Rice in the bunker in D.C. was only later relayed to Rumsfeld. Rice received the order, reported it to Cheney, and Cheney then suppressed the order for a considerable amount of time, during which the Pentagon was, apparently, struck by the hostile aircraft. Following this, it is possible that the order was given and jet fighters were scrambled, as reported being the case from both Langley Base in Virginia and Otis Base in Massachusetts. And at that point, it can be argued whether or not United 93 was shot down by one of the jet fighters. What gave Dick Cheney the idea that it was legal to sit on the order to shoot down an aircraft that, it is believed, 
subsequently crashed into the Pentagon where Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld himself was that morning? Is this evidence of Cheney attempting to assassinate Rumsfeld? Well, yes and no. Yes, it could be used as such. No, that was not the lone intention. On May 8, 2001, Rumsfeld and Cheney, old cronies from the Nixon administration, began a subtle transfer of power over the military into the direct hands of the executive office. Confer source article from the Washington Post, May 8, 2001, for more info. This article actually mentions use of WMDs in war games and the future Department of Homeland Security by name. Under then-director Joe Alba, a new department of FEMA was created. FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, is something like a national insurance agency. They are only needed part of the time, but they have to function all of the time. In short, it's a money pit. But the new department offered spontaneous hope for the doddering Infrastructure Reinforcement Agency on 9-11. The new office, the ONP, Office of National Preparedness, was established specifically to counter the threat of terrorism, and it was to be run specifically by Dick Cheney. The department was meant to be, for FEMA, what the FBI's NDP, National Domestic Preparedness, office had been previously a way for the agency to interface with local police, rescue, and communications departments. So why would FEMA be put in charge in place of the FBI over a public interface department for the reason of combating terrorism? Unlike the FBI, NDP, the FEMA, ONP, had the ability to mobilize United States military personnel within their own national borders. And this was the department that Dick Cheney was using to coordinate the annual exercise, Global Guardian, and specifically, Vigilant Guardian, simulating crashing planes into buildings on 9-11. So the Vice President of the United States believed he, himself, and not without technically legal justification, was the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the United States on 9-11. This is probably the best argument of apology for Cheney's 9-11 why blunder. If the incoming aircraft reported on NORAD radar, but noticeably absent from FAA radars from 30 miles out of D.C., was not what caused the explosion at the Pentagon, then A, what was on the NORAD radar, and B, what caused the Pentagon explosion. Let's back way up for a second to what I'd mentioned about COG. The COG redundant location for Air Force One is the E-4 Doomsday Plane. Its official code name is Night Watch. An article can be found about it on Wikipedia under National Airborne Operations Center. Now this plane was filmed by CNN flying over the White House protected airspace on the morning of 9-11 around the exact same time as the Pentagon was struck. The knee-jerk reaction is that the E-4 Doomsday Night Watch was the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. But we do not need a plane to have impacted the Pentagon on 9-11 to account for the E-4 plane being there. It is possible that it was the E-4 en route to D.C. that appeared on the NORAD radar, but disappeared from the FAA radar that was the same incoming, unidentified aircraft that Cheney belayed the order to shoot down. However, whether this plane was or was not the plane NORAD radar read, 
and whether this plane was or was not actually the same aircraft Cheney ordered to stand down from are both separate issues. So is the explosion at the Pentagon. Here, look. A. The plane on NORAD radar, but not on FAA radar. B. The incoming aircraft that Cheney stood down the order to shoot. C. The explosion at the Pentagon. These three can all be explained in one of two ways, or else each can be explained on its own. These explanations are 1. There was only one plane, the hijacked commercial airliner, and it was crashed into the Pentagon. This is the official story. 2. The one plane was actually the E-4 Night Watch, and it launched a missile into the Pentagon. This might be the fallback story. 3. There was no plane involved in the Pentagon crash. A. The NORAD, no FAA, radar image may have been of a missile or of the E-4. B. The aircraft Cheney stood down the shoot-down order for may have been a missile or the E-4. C. The explosion at the Pentagon may have been a missile or on-site explosives. So let's sort this out. Of all these possible options, which can we rule out? We can question the official story for several reasons, mainly because it may be a cover story by the criminals themselves. We can rule out the E-4 shooting a missile at the Pentagon because it does not have missiles. Also, if it was not the E-4 or the unidentified craft on NORAD radar that deployed the missile, i.e. if it was the missile itself that NORAD radar read and which Cheney stood down the order to shoot down, then it must have been fired from more than 50 miles away to the southwest. We can pretty much safely rule this option out, too. So, what do we have left? It is the most likely scenario that the explosion at the Pentagon was caused by on-site explosives and that the E-4 was the plane on NORAD, not FAA radar, which Cheney ordered not shot down. So, we can see how, according to No Plane's Truth, NPT, the presence of the E-4 and the explosion at the Pentagon can both be accounted for. However, were these separate incidents or not? Did the explosion at the Pentagon occur at the exact same time as the E-4 flew overhead by coincidence? 10.39 a.m. NMCC at Pentagon First, let's look at something anomalous about the disappearance of Flight 77. There was a ghost United 93 reported parked at a commercial airport near a space lease to NASA, seen later that day. However, within the hour, a ghost plane of Flight 77 that allegedly crashed into the Pentagon was seen on NORAD radars hundreds of miles northwest of D.C., now, the sight of a ghost United 93 on the ground near a NASA facility is actually less surprising than the Ghost Flight 77 on NORAD radar, because by the time the Ghost Flight 77 appeared on NORAD radar, all commercial flights had been grounded. The Ghost Flight 77 was reported heading towards Johnson, Pennsylvania at 10.06 a.m., at around 10.30 a.m., Patrick Madigan, a Penn State cop, after arriving on the scene of the United 93 crash site, sees what he describes as a jetliner circling the crash site very low. This jetliner was believed at the time to be carrying United Airlines executives. Now, a funny thing suddenly happens at 10.32. Vice President Cheney phones President Bush and tells him that Air Force One may be a target, specifically stating a time frame of 40 to 90 
minutes before a protective fighter force could be assembled as an escort for the president's plane. The result was that the president's plane, officially titled Air Force One, was rerouted an extra distance of 800 miles to Barksdale Air Force Base near Shreveport, Louisiana, where the president then remains the better part of the afternoon until 1 p.m. All of this is, specifically according to Cheney, at the behest of himself and Condoleezza Rice. The president's next destination after leaving Barksdale Air Force Base at 1.30 in the afternoon of 9-11 was decided between 12.58 and 1.25 p.m. on a direct phone line between President Bush and Vice President Cheney. So what have we here? Two separate phone calls, the first from Cheney lasting between 10.32, confirmed by witness to the president, until ending at 10.39, confirmed on Cheney's end when he turns to address Rumsfeld. This call connected the President of the U.S. on Air Force One and Dick Cheney at the NMCC, National Mission Control Center, which by this time had managed to find its way over to the Pentagon, apparently, instead of half an hour earlier, Rumsfeld arriving at the White House bunker. According to the record, Cheney immediately notified Rumsfeld at that time that there were scrambled fighter jets and that the pilots of those jets had been given the shoot-down order. Cheney added, That is correct, and it's my understanding they've already taken a couple of aircraft out. So, to sum up, between 9.37, when the south wall explodes, and 10.39, by which time Rumsfeld reappears at the NMCC to find him there. Cheney has transported his base of operations from the White House bunker to the Pentagon. Now we know from the official tapes released by NORAD that the order to shoot down planes that had been given by Bush to Rice from Booker to the bunker was not passed along to the pilots themselves until after United 93 had already crashed. That's the official explanation of the delay during which it is obvious that Cheney intercepted and stood down the shoot-to-kill order. But United 93 crashed at 10.03, which means Cheney stood down the shoot-down order, not only from when it was received by Condoleezza Rice until 9.37, when the Pentagon is hit, but for an additional 62 minutes even after that, until 10.39, when Rumsfeld re-enters the picture. So let's look at a specific timeline. 9.16 a.m. At the latest, this is when Bush's shoot-down order is relayed to Condoleezza Rice, after the pet goat and Andy Card's second warning. 937. Flight 77 strikes Pentagon. This makes the minimum difference between the shoot-down order being given by Bush and Cheney's order for the deployment of fighter jets 21 minutes. 1003. Flight 93 crashes in Pennsylvania. Subsequent to this time, the pilots themselves receive the shoot-down order, given by the president himself, 47 minutes earlier. 10.06. Ghost Flight 77 reported headed toward Johnston, Pennsylvania. Around 10.30. Penn State PD Patrick Madigan witnesses strange incident of circling low jetliner. 10.32, Cheney telephones Bush, orders him to ground Air Force One. 10.39, Rumsfeld enters the NMCC at the Pentagon. Cheney informs him multiple planes shot down. This represents the maximum difference in time between when the President gave the shoot-down order 
at 9.16 at the latest, and when the pilots receive the order, for a grand total of 83 minutes, or 1 hour and 23 minutes. After 10.39 a.m., COG Wargames Blowback. The second phone conversation between President Bush and Vice President Cheney begins at 12.58 and purportedly lasts until 1.25 p.m. However, between these two calls, Richard Clark in the White House Situation Room at around 12.30 is told to go downstairs to the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, P.E.O.C., there, Cheney complains by way of teleconference call that the communications in this place are terrible, explaining that his calls to President Bush keep getting broken off. Apparently, others on the open line of the conference call at this time included Condoleezza Rice, political advisor Mary Matlin, Cheney's aide I. Lewis Scooter Libby, and, among a few others, the vice president's wife, Lynn Cheney. While Cheney is apparently trying to beep in on W, the president himself is making a short speech to a small assembled press corps at Barksdale. In this brief speech, Bush states, Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward and freedom will be defended. Bush is on the line with Rumsfeld from 1.02 p.m., who we know was by that time with Cheney. At 1.05, Bush takes a moment to make some personal calls when U.S. Stratcom apparently relays a message to him about a high-speed object seen over the president's ranch near Crawford, Texas. Then there is a gap in the timeline of, literally, about a half an hour. By 1.30, Bush is back in Air Force One for his second flight of the day, this time toward Offutt Air Force Base, Nebraska, and the offices of U.S. Stratcom itself. And now, a word about U.S. Stratcom from Wikipedia. Quote, U.S. STRATCOM controls the nuclear weapons assets of the United States military. It is also a globally focused command and a global integrator charged with the missions of space operations, information operations, integrated missile defense, global command and control, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, Global Strike, Strategic Deterrence, and Combating Weapons of Mass Destruction. Source English, Wikipedia Org, U.S. Stratcom. At that time, they have since been absorbed into United States Space Command in 2002. U.S. Stratcom's role was the operation of the E-6 Mercury Airborne Command Post, codenamed Looking Glass, that was the COG redundancy for NORAD's much-touted Cheyenne Mountain Facility. U.S. STRATCOM was where Admiral Richard Meese, Commander-in-Chief of U.S. STRATCOM, was coordinating the three E-4B Doomsday planes in the air on 9-11 as part of Operation Global Guardian. Meese was reportedly having breakfast that morning with the Federal Advisory Committee's chairman, retired Lieutenant General Brent Snowcroft, and multi-billionaire Warren Buffett as part of a charity fundraiser that was to be held later in the day. Meanwhile, it would be easy for Cheney to delegate his authority at that point because by 1.30 p.m. in the afternoon of 9-11-2001, Cheney himself was at Site R, R for Raven Rock, Pennsylvania. Why Pennsylvania? Because that's where he had flown between 10.39 
and 1258 when he was on the conference call to Richard Clark in the PEOC. He flew there in the E-4 Doomsday Night Watch plane with Condoleezza Rice, Donald Rumsfeld, and Scooter Libby in tow and his wife on the phone. And why cite R? Because that was the COG backup for the Pentagon and DOD housing the Emergency Operations Center for the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. From Site R, Cheney placed himself in charge over the entire armed services of the United States of America. We cannot say with absolute certainty that Cheney was at Site R by 1258 when the second phone call to Bush begins. We can, however, say with some degree of certainty that if Cheney had left D.C. between 1039 and 1258, he would probably have been back on the ground before 1.30 p.m. when Air Force One gets airborne to fly the president to U.S. STRATCOM. Ultimately, whether Cheney's location was Site R, or whether it was any of the other underground military installations for COG, is irrelevant, because by around 12.30 p.m., he has physically disappeared and his whereabouts are unaccounted for from then on. Whether Cheney was at Site R or at any other base, he was most likely there by no later than 1.30 p.m. when the phone call between President George W. Bush and Vice President Dick Cheney ends and Air Force One takes off carrying the President to U.S. STRATCOM HQ in Nebraska. The real question therefore, isn't where was Dick Cheney by 1.30 p.m., nor is the question why did Cheney send Bush to U.S. STRATCOM then. The real question is, specifically, who was in the E-4 that overflew the Pentagon explosion? Who was in the E-4 that overflew the crash site of United 93? And who was most probably at Site R in Pennsylvania before 1.30 p.m. on 9-11-2001. 10.39, Ultimate Consequences. The point is, and this should be considered extremely important, Dick Cheney is responsible for the explosion at the Pentagon as having been able to prevent it had he relayed the order to do so. This is called complicity, such as in the case of someone who, by their passive observation, allows a crime to be committed which it would have been within their power to prevent. It does not directly imply malice of forethought. However, let's look at this further. We now know that Larry Silverstein has admitted to pulling Building 7. We also know now that Cheney stood down the order to scramble fighter jets beforehand until after the Pentagon had been hit. So there are two of the people responsible for and who have benefited from 9-11. Inasmuch as Larry Silverstein was directly responsible for the collapse of World Trade Center Towers 1 and 2 by having installed explosives in them before 9-11, as would have been necessary for him to have pulled Building 7, then so Dick Cheney was responsible for the explosion of the Pentagon by being able to have prevented it and choosing instead to allow it to happen. But aside from the evidence of their both having benefited and both having been responsible, can we directly tie the one event to the other? Consider this in particular in the absence of planes. If the explosion at the Pentagon and the initial explosions at the World Trade Center towers were not caused by planes, can we still say that Silverstein and Cheney can be held accountable for them? And more importantly, can we tie one event to the other without planes and prove that Silverstein and Cheney acted in collusion with one another on 9-11? Obviously, if there were no hijacked airliners crashed into them at all, 
and the felling of the World Trade Center towers was accomplished exclusively by the detonation of explosives inside the buildings themselves, then Larry Silverstein's guilt for having planted these explosives would be even greater than if the jet fuel of the planes ignited the explosives he would have had to have had planted prior to 9-11. But there are degrees of guilt. There's only guilty or not. And insofar as Silverstein has admitted implicitly that Building 7 was pulled by priorly placed explosives, then his guilt for those killed in the identical felling of World Trade Center Towers 1 and 2 is clear. But what about Cheney? We know he has benefited in the aftermath of 9-11, and that his actions clearly indicate his involvement in the crimes of that day. It was even Kellogg, Brown, and Root, KBR, the construction firm arm of Halliburton, Dick Cheney's own company, that was contracted to reinforce the Pentagon's southwest wall, and it was white, unmarked KBR trailers that were parked along the wall that day of the explosion there. It's pretty blatant who the perpetrators of the crime on 9-11 were, but the problem in tying their separate crimes together into one is not finding the motive, since both have benefited since. The problem is in finding someone to operate as a coordinator between the two, allowing each to act independently and without any apparent direct contact between one another during the crime. To answer that, we do have to look to the skies on the day of 9-11, but what we see there might surprise us now that we've thought about it enough to ignore the obvious that we all saw the second plane crashing into the World Trade Center. No, what we're looking for is the connection between the we scam black helicopters in New York City coordinating with Larry Silverstein and the E-4 seen over DC coordinating with Cheney. So lastly, let's look at the most relevant questions. Did the explosion at the Pentagon occur at the exact same time as the E-4 flew overhead by coincidence? Who was in the E-4 that overflew the Pentagon explosion? Who was in the E-4 that overflew the crash site of United 93? And who was most probably at Site R in Pennsylvania before 1.30 p.m. on 9-11-2001? There's a less obvious, better question to ask here. Where was George Herbert Walker Bush, the current president's father, on the morning of 9-11. Answer, quote, He admits himself that he was at the White House the night before, but says he flew to St. Paul, Minnesota the next morning. Unquote. Source from David Icke. He was in D.C. that morning, after having spoken the previous evening for a meeting held by the Carlisle Group. The Carlisle Group speaker for 9-11 was actually King Fahd of the House of Saud, the royal family of Saudi Arabia. I speculate Cheney's location to have been Site R because I believe he went there between 1039 and 1258, following former President George Herbert Walker Bush, GHWB, who had flown there via Johnston, Pennsylvania, where his E-4 was seen circling low over the United 93 crash site at 10.30 a.m. It's a widely documented fact that GHWB is one of the only former presidents to invoke the executive directive to receive daily intelligence briefings. It is widely documented that the Secret Service, who guard the president and the Saudi Arabian Embassy in D.C., across the street from the Watergate Hotel, also guard former presidents, and it is widely documented there were a group dispatched to protect then Halliburton CEO Cheney during the 2000 presidential campaign. 
it is less of widely documented fact that the Johnson Pennsylvania Aviation Center closest to the United 93-1003 crash site was evacuated around 1030 due to a phone call placed directly to an employee's office warning that another hijacked airliner was targeting their small local airport. It is less widely documented that the majority of false alarms called in on 9-11 were phone calls similarly placed directly to administrative authority officials who were in certain key locations at specific times throughout the day. By evacuating such sites, it created a strategic advantage to any air traffic that happened to want to fly by them off radar. That is, as much as is WeScam of the NSA, a strategic calling card of the CIA. But what is not documented at all is the sign held up off-camera shown to our president as Secret Service Andy Card whispered in his ear, Sir, America is under attack. This handwritten sign held up by Press Secretary Ari Fleischer read simply, Don't say anything yet. I just want to know, whose handwriting was it? <laughs>